Hey Sam mate, how's it going? Hey Jordan, how are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Uh, back from ice climbing actually. So uh, a little tired, but a uh, good day out in the mountains. Oh, awesome, nice. Yeah, I've seen you be mixing it up quite a bit on your Instagram feed. Is that is that just because of the conditions out in Zermatt? Yeah, conditions uh, in the Alps right now are not like terribly good. Definitely Zermatt, we have a low snow season till now. And of course, I want to keep in shape. I go ski, skiing every second day, but then in between, I try to do a lot of bouldering, ice climbing, also just to maintain my body and and the physical uh, strength. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you live just up the hill in Zermatt, don't you? It's like sort of halfway up the first uh, telecabine. Is that right? Well, I just uh, I just live. Uh, up from the church to the right side up. So it's pretty much in Zermatt itself. I think, uh, yeah. I still, if I go to the, to the to the cable car, it's two minutes walk. If I go to groceries, it's like five minutes walk. So it's a little bit in the center, but uh, still away from everybody. And if I walk this direction, I can do a thousand vertical meters without seeing anybody. So that anybody. So that's, that's, it. Cool. that's the dream, isn't it? And how, how close is all the uh, climbing to you? Say like the ice climbing and stuff. Yeah, the, the ice climbing is just around the corner. So we have uh, also climbing here. And that's I think that's a cool thing about Zermatt, about growing up here, is that everything is so condensed and it doesn't matter what you want to do. You have always something that you just go out and you can grab i can grab my tool but whatever i like here and just go out and out and enjoy the day yeah that's pretty yeah that's, amazing that's amazing. sick yeah that's sick so yeah while we're on the subject of zermatt let, tell me a bit about your upbringing i realize you're you're sort of zermatt born and bred aren't you is that right that's right i actually i'm standing in the in the garage of uh of my grandparents uh house which my brothers and myself, we, we, we could buy uh, a few years ago. And I just, uh, I grew up like 50 meters away in, in my parents' house. And yeah, that's where, where, where I lived uh, my whole life. And it's cool because it's super nice, uh, a nice base also to travel around the world. So we have uh, Geneva and Zur Zurich that are quite close as airports. So it's cool to to travel around, but then coming back, this is really like the base where I feel home, and I can train on the four thousand meter peaks on the slopes, and it's just it just has a lot of uh, variety, I would say. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I was in Switzerland recently, um, and we're in sort of the Valley region, and it's just amazing. Obviously, you have the Zermatt Valley, but then you have sort of the the whole of the Electorina. You keep going further down, you have, you have Lax, is that right? And then South Fay. You got tons of valleys. South Fay is, is actually not far away, but it's uh, if you drive, it's one and a half hours. And, yeah. and then there are so many valleys. If you go from Zerma to East, it's, it's quite, quite far, quite gathered with valleys. Uh, west definitely goes all the way to Chamonix with a lot of valleys and a lot of possibilities to 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 do alpinism to do ski touring and also all the the north side the the jungfrau area is uh, is actually on wallis ground so you, yeah it's it's a huge playground yeah oh awesome nice and um yeah i guess we we briefly touched on it but what what was it like for you as a kid you know being brought up in zermatt like a lot of people say in the uk are just brought up in these you know low-level towns and then we have to travel travel to places like Zermatt to go skiing sort of once or twice a year but what was it actually like being able to just walk out your door like you said and just just go for a ski when you're a kid it's it was what it what it is today also it's uh, it's liberty for me it's really our parents they were like putting us in ski dresses and old ski clothes and then they kicked us out of the of the house and told us like you're gonna come back when it's dark and that's what we did pretty much we could just really out of our doorstep you could already put on your skis right now if i go outside here i can put on my skis i can ski down into the garden towards the 
the, the cable car. And it's definitely, it brings a certain liberty. Also what I told you before that I can just run up the hill just behind me and do a crazy training. Uh, and that's, you know, when I do a training, I don't need to think like for hours where, how I can, how, how I have to drive to this place or how, where I have to go. It's actually like some days are really planned, but other days I'm, I just think, okay, I want to do a training of one hour. I grab my skis here and I run up the mountain and that's, it's an easy access. It brings a lot of liberty. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And obviously yours, say yours and Jeremy Heights, your, your, your ski style is really unique and it's, you know, you guys have stamped your mark on a lot of the mountain faces. Did, did you grow up sort of ski racing when you were a young kid in, in Zerma? Is, is that what sort of gave you that sort of, you know, barely any turns, really fast, aggressive style? No, not at all. Like uh, my brother, Simon, he, he was on the ski racing team for one, one year. And then it was too expensive for my parents. We, we are four children and it's just like the parents decided it's not gonna, that's not gonna work out. But for, for me personally, it was always like that challenge to go off piece to, to jump around. I wasn't like a good skier in my young age. I was just like going down everywhere, but, but technically not really uh, strong, I would say. It was later on when I became a ski instructor where I properly learned how to to do like a real carving turn. And that's where also like I, I evolved technically and where I could also see, yeah, having fun on those turns, you know, because yeah. it's, it's if you if you ski technically right, it's a super fun and and great. Uh, also a great feeling yeah yeah for sure i, I mean i've seen seen your skiing obviously and it, you just like you make it look like a playground almost yeah definitely i think that's that's uh, everything about uh, free riding that you make something difficult look easy and you play with the nature and just uh, go with the flow yeah so yeah, just obviously you, you spoke about your, your siblings earlier and um, reading through your family's achievements is, is quite amazing. Obviously on the one end, you've got Simon, who I believe won the Pile de Or, and then you've got Martin, who's like a ski mountaineering champion as well. And then obviously you, your, your skiing achievements and climbing achievements don't really need much introduction. So, um, but I was interested to hear sort of why do you think yourself, Simon and Martin each went d down a separate route down the mountain lifestyle, if that makes sense? You know, what, why, what makes you think, or why didn't you all go down the free ride life? Like, why did you each choose a separate pathway? Yeah, I think every, every personality has a certain strength and uh, like we were always, I was always climbing with Simon. So Simon was, one of my best uh, rope partner in the mountains and martin he was already at young age he was fully into hockey so he was playing hockey till he was like 18 years old and then he was like like myself i'm not a big guy so he was not like big enough to to f play further at the at the at the strong level so he changed into into endurance sport and that's why you see all those shoes here the trail running shoes though those are from martin he also did the world record on the, like 3000 meter vertical meters and i think that that's his speci speciality and he was always a little bit in his on his way but simon and myself we climbed a lot and after uh, like 2011 when i changed to free riding Simon was uh, was more still climbing, but then changed now to to being a heli pilot. So we we went off into different directions, and of course, myself I I don't see myself as a pilot and not as an ultra runner. But my my talent is in free riding. So everybody of us was just going a bit in the direction, yeah, 
that they want to also that's for me my talent is definitely in in sports in moving yeah yeah nice yeah it's just um yeah it's just really interesting to see obviously you're all down that sort of mountain pathway but then you've you've gone your separate ways it is a really interesting interesting thing and um obviously going back to your your skiing yourself obviously your your skiing is is unique do you see more more children sort of picking up your your kind of like i said really fast very few turns type style do you do you see more children progressing that style in the future yeah i think it's it's a style um not only like the fast and fluid style but also going to those big 4000 meter peaks around Zermatt and and just like touring up and bringing also the ability to climb them it's it's definitely a trend that we see that also a lot of uh, younger uh, generations are doing now and i think with uh, what we also have to say with la list too now is that we also wanted to show how difficult it can be not that uh, that we inspire like all people just to go out and ski like super fast down those mountains also that you yeah that there are like big decisions to take and it, that it's not always easy so i think it's it's a good progression i really see the younger uh, generations taking the, that up but what it's really important is also to understand the safety matters and everything we we train and uh, put in consideration to make it as safe as possible it's it's really important to also see that yeah yeah and i mean yeah that is a really big thing you'd say obviously the the safety side because you and jeremy have spent you know essentially all your life honing in and perfecting your mountain craft to go and take your skills to the himalaya and the big alpine faces so do, do you feel that that needs to be shown more in ski media and say in videos the it, it seems like it's it's being shown more and more but do you think more needs to be done no i think it's it showed more it's it doesn't have to be like too much neither otherwise it's going to be boring but i think it's really really important to talk about that topic and just to yeah to not always have like a, a high life or let's say what we ha experience now with social media is it can can be quite dangerous also because you only see the the, the perfect uh, situation the perfect two or three seconds and everybody who's watching it thinks that on the weekend when he's off he has to deliver the same thing and and that can go wrong it's a sometimes a, a wrong vision on what we do also so of course of course we cannot like show you guys like our whole life of decisions otherwise you're gonna be bored and you're gonna fall asleep but it's it's really important to also talk about that that side that topic yeah yeah for sure yeah i guess i guess people I guess people won't want to sort of sit there watching, you know, you guys and the snow safety team digging snow pits and, and cutting slopes and maybe even turning back. I, I think these, you know, the behind the scenes style edits are really good to sort of show, you know, you know, exactly what goes into or how much effort goes into filming, you know, this 10 second clip of you and Jeremy just caning it down a face. It's, I think the behind the scenes style is, is quite a good way of, of sort of getting that across um and continuing about or continuing on about uh la list tell me a bit about la list for people who are watching that maybe don't know too much about it you know like where is it where is it filmed first of all so first of all where is it filmed so if you go to our goal was to go to six thousand meter peaks to ski on six thousand meter peaks and that's yeah in the Swiss Alps, it's not possible. So we traveled to to Peru, to the Andi Andes, and also to Pakistan, to the Himalayas. And we had like several more uh, like locations, like India and Nepal on the radar. 
but also with COVID, we were uh, like quite a bit, uh, yeah, limited down. But at the end, it it worked out well, and definitely, what you're gonna see from Pakistan is uh, is a a country that is just. Uh, for myself, one of the nicest countries to, to travel to with super nice people and some of the best uh, skiable peaks that I have ever seen. Yeah. yeah, I think I've seen I've seen some clips of you, you guys sort of getting the local the local cultures on on a pair of skis. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Well, we were actually skiing that day and then coming back to base camp. Our porters were uh, just yes yeah, sitting sitting next to camp, and we we told them let's let's try try some skiing and we put them in our ski boots and just on a flat glacier they were skiing by themselves like at the end uh, even uh, we had a paraglider with us so we we were uh, pulling one guy on the paraglider and at the end he was like flying a little bit for a few meters and that was like yeah super super good moments you know in the middle of no nowhere we were hiking for seven days full on over a huge glacier glacier our base camp was at almost 5000 meters so it's uh yeah i think really those those moments are super special yeah yeah, sorry. Um, I did just have a note to ask you about your um, your favorite moment. So, was it more a favorite moment of yours? Was meeting those local local porters, or was it the skiing? Like, what 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 was the favorite moment of yours? Uh, difficult to say, but of course, like the skiing, it's something I see uh, from the athlete's per perspective. It's really important, but of of course, if you, yeah. If you get invited, uh, for example, in Pakistan, we got invited to the Ramadan. So they, they were uh, not eating for quite a long time. And at the end, we were just uh, driving down to Lahore. And there there was a big, big uh, cathedral where we could we were actually not allowed to go in. But at the end, they invited us. And they even invited us to to sit down and to eat with with those with, with them, and I think those those moments are way yeah way stronger for me because the skiing it's for me it's like the everyday life, and having yeah. this experience with those people it's yeah it was super strong yeah. Oh, that's awesome! And talking about you, you know, you were trekking in for a week or seven days you know, to get to these peaks and then I guess you have to ascend the mountain. You know, did did that feel strange being so far out in the wilderness in the in the back country? Did that change your way you were skiing at all? Did you tone it down or did you still go just go for it? No, definitely being so exposed and so remote, uh, it's something also you're gonna see in a movie that uh, you cannot yeah, you cannot ski at the same level. Definitely what we have experienced something, an, ac an accident actually in, in Peru. And that was also showing us that w where we want to go, we are so exposed that, yeah, we cannot be like little kids, like jumping uh, cliffs. And we, we really had to ski a lot more uh, sensible on the, on the, on that side. Yeah. Ah, oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Really looking forward to checking out La List. Um, when when can we expect it to be dropping? I guess you you started the premieres, haven't you? We started the film premieres. We did a movie a movie tour in uh, in France and also Austria, but then Austria got got shut down because of the COVID. And actually, it's gonna be visible. I've, I'm not sure. Sometime in February, I think. That's uh, Red Bull is gonna drop it on on the web, of yeah. what I heard, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. I'm I'm stoked to check it out. Really looking forward to it. And um, yeah, just just the last few questions. Um, obviously, I can see you've got your full sort of faction quiver of skis there. I guess that's not even your full quiver, but um, yeah, I had a 
I had a, I was thinking about about your skiing and watching your skiing, and something I noticed was that you you're almost always on a different pair of skis. You know, you're always changing between the Agent, the CT, um, and the Dictator series. Is is that to mainly match the snow conditions, or is it more to match your ski style that you want to sort of the way that you want to ski on the day? I think that's a bit uh, a problem of the sponsored skiers. If you have, if you can choose of all those skis, you you think always like, okay, what conditions do I gonna get today, and what do, what do I wanna ride today? And at the end, you try. I even see myself like uh, sometimes mounting a ski in the morning at seven here. So it's <laughs> that's, it can be also a problem, but it's yeah. Back to your question, it's really depending on the on the line that I want to ski, on the ski day that I want to have. Like, of course, the Candide is more playful. It's where when I want to do more like freestyle, freestylish days, I would say. And then definitely, if you look to the agent, the dictator, that those are the the like big mountain skis, the technical skis that, yeah, the. the for example, this this dictator that was the one that I had in in Pakistan also, and yeah, dictator three super nice ski. I can even carve on the slope right now because we don't have that much snow, but it's it's yeah, it's cool to have a ski sponsor with a lot of good skis, so you can also choose from yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Faction have really, really nailed their their, their range recently. Um, I think what they were missing was the Dictator, that sort of more directional metal ski. But now they've got that in there, it's, it's sick. It's a sick range. Yeah, definitely. The Dictator is, for me personally, it's like before it would have been the comp ski. Now it's like really my charging ski. I know if I go, go filming, I need the dictator and depending on how much snow I go for the 3.0 or the 4.0. Yeah, yeah, nice. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but um, and I'm sure you, you are ready for this question, but I was going to ask if you had one ski to ski, no matter what the conditions, no matter what ski style you want to ski in, um, what, what would it be? Would it be a dictator? Yeah, it would be, it would be actually this one. So it's... Uh, yeah. Actually, does it's it's a ski that is skiable in all conditions, and of course, with a, a candid uh, five zero, if you have a lot of powder, you got more surface, so it's easier. But like an everyday ski, that's my go to, the Dictator three point oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And just for the for the ski nerds out there that might be interested in a Dictator. You're you're normally running them like plus two, from from recommended. Is that right? Uh, plus one one point five actually from recommended. Okay. Yeah, uh, it depends also. Like this is the one eighty, and this one is yeah plus one five. I tried okay, no. I tried also plus three, which is depending also on conditions. But I think what plus one five, I'm I'm pretty good there yeah i feel comfort comfortable comfortable yeah. yeah yeah it's quite interesting that plus plus 1.5 on a sort of metal directional ski i guess that gives it a bit more playful sort of a slightly looser characteristics i think i just have like more yeah more power on the shovel and definitely if you look to the dolomites the segment we 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 uh, filmed last year with faction it is important to really go like in front and to be able to to yeah give your ski a direct direction yeah nice cool yeah and just one last question about the the gear obviously you're consistently skiing on the cast system do you yeah and there's a lot of comp competitors coming up like marco obviously have their duke pt16 salomon have the shift um do you reckon you'll always stay on the cast? Is that because it gives you the option to ski on the Pivot 18? Well, I don't know, like the, the cast really, for me, it serves super well right now because it's simple, it, it works well. And uh, you can see I have it now on almost like 
think seven or eight pairs of skis so i can super easily switch and that's for me it's perfect so i have one binding system for all those skis of course it's it is really heavy and right now i'm still like yeah i haven't skied with the with the duke i haven't skied i have skied with the with the salomon shift but it's something yeah i can right now it's still not where i want it to be able to to go on those big peaks yeah but definitely yeah, I, like I mean, I, sorry what was that definitely like i'm skiing a lot with uh, nico vignet and he's he's like super stoked on the salomon shift because it's it has a really low uh, point so you're standing low on the on the ski and he says for freestyling it's also a, a binding that works super well with the ski that he's skiing on skiing on yeah yeah for sure i i was just about to say like for people like me say i think and i guess a lot of people watching this the shift and pt16 um is more than enough binding to to get us through all conditions all terrain but i guess you know people like yourselves toff and jeremy you know you guys need you know as much um as much binding as possible to keep you in and to keep you on the ski when you're railing those turns down those faces yeah definitely that's it is that difference that we ski a lot on exposed terrain super fast and that's yeah where you need a binding that is quite solid and also yeah. that's that's why we yeah why we believe in it it's super heavy you know to bring those skis to six thousand meter meters it's not a an easy topic no sure and um i was i was just gonna ask is the uh the agent 3.0x there just for when you want to go for, go ski for a coffee <laughs> no that's from my girlfriend so actually she she's also on the same setup that i am yeah yeah i'm just i'm just messing with you <laughs> um yeah that's that's all of it for gear um i was just going to rattle a few quick questions like do you have a favorite ski resort um, is it close to home? Is it in Switzerland? What's where? Where's favorite for you? Favorite ski resort is Zermatt for me. Definitely, it's uh, yeah, uh, it's what I know the best also, and it it has that much terrain. Of course, now we don't have the best the best snow conditions, but actually, you can ski four thousand meter peaks. You can ski trees. You got everything in between, and that's yeah, it's a cool resort. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of lines around there, but I was, I was going to ask, um, you know, a favorite descent of yours. Is it, is it off the bright on that North side? Yeah, definitely. One of those lines on the North side, for example, the thrifty grot, it's yeah. Super nice, uh, aesthetic line. Well, there are so many lines around it, so it's difficult to really pick one. It really depends also on the, yeah, on the daily conditions. Yeah, yeah, for sure, totally. And um, I guess one last question, what, what's next for you? What's coming up as far as you can say? Have you got a lot of filming projects coming up? Yeah, quite a few filming projects coming up. Um, two with, uh, with North Face right now, which is quite cool. Also, Faction is um, dropping uh, this, the new ski line, so... Uh, we're gonna film some stuff with, with faction in the future also, and yeah, that's that's gonna be quite a busy winter again. So last winter I was already busy, and I told myself less, I need less film pro project, and now I'm at the same point again. Yeah, it's it's always the way, I imagine. But um, but yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what you've what you've got cooking up, and obviously checking out La List too when we can finally get our eyes on it yeah do so and i hope you like it yeah sweet cheers for your time sam thanks Jordan. Yeah. see ya